England, an author compiles a book of tales from fellow pilgrims journeying to Canterbury. Upon arriving at a small town, poet Geoffrey Chaucer enters the gate with his horse and bumps into an old man with a tattoo-filled face. Shortly after, he arrives at the Tabard Inn, where he meets pilgrims en route to Canterbury. There, a guide arrives and welcomes the travelers. He then stands in the middle and shares his idea that each person should tell a story to make their journey entertaining. After everyone agrees, Chaucer begins to write down his fellow pilgrims' tales. The first tale is about an old merchant named Sir January, who announces his marriage decision. In his declaration, he asks for everyone's help searching for a wife and claims he wants a young maiden. The following day, the old man goes outside, and among the crowd, he spots a kind May who is busy caring for children. He is immediately attracted to the woman's beauty, prompting him to call his men and inform them that he finally found the lady he wants to marry. Following this, Sir January marries May, who only has little interest in him. During the ceremony, May is enjoying her meal when she suddenly sees the handsome attendant, Damien, from a distance. As they look at each other, they secretly fall in love. Before the newlywed's honeymoon, a priest blesses their bed. Afterward, the senior merchant drives everyone away to be alone with his wife. While he talks romantically to her, the uninterested woman yawns. Outside, Damien hears them and feels disappointed. Later, the man pens a letter and confesses his undying love for the merchant's wife. In the message, he adds that if she did not make love to him, his life would end. Following their private moment, a tired Sir January calls it a night and sleeps beside his uninterested wife, who rolls her tongue out at him behind his back. The following morning, Sir January brings his wife to his beautiful garden and informs her that he only has the key. There, he urges his spouse to spend an intimate time with him. In the same area, the god Pluto and his wife Persephone laugh as they observe the couple. Later that night, while her husband sleeps, May responds to Damien's letter, telling him she loves him too. She promises him that she'll steal the key from her husband so they can make love in the enchanting garden. The following morning, Sir January wakes up and screams that he is blind, prompting everyone to gather around his bed. He then searches for his spouse among the crowd. After finding her, the old man grabs his wife's wrist and asserts he'll never let her go. During breakfast, May assists his husband with his meal. Suddenly, the agitated merchant stands up and tells everyone to get out. Shortly after, the woman and Damien look at each other, intending to execute their plan to be together in the garden. Later, the blind merchant orders his wife to take him to the garden. As the couple enters the place, Pluto expresses pity for the old man because his spouse is deceiving him. He plans to give the senior merchant his sight back to help him discover his wife's betrayal. Upon hearing this, Prosperina argues that if the god restores Sir January's sight, she will give May the power of words so the wife can devise a believable excuse to cover up her treacherous act. As May takes her husband further into the garden, a concealed Damien awaits her on the tree. When Sir January initiates intimate time with his wife, the woman desires to to eat mulberries on the tree. When the merchant tells her that no boy can climb the tree for her, she deceives and pushes him forward. The woman then makes her husband a makeshift ladder so she can reach Damien and make love to him. Upon witnessing this, Pluto waves his hand and restores the merchant's sight. Shortly after, the old man looks up and screams upon seeing May's affair, prompting the other man to run off. When Sir January calls out his wife for having an affair, the woman comes up with an excuse with the help of Prosperina. She informs informs her spouse that his eyesight is faulty and that jealousy makes him see strange things. When she claims that what happened to him is a miracle, the merchant smiles and decides to forget everything to start anew with his wife. The couple then reconciles and walks out of the garden happily. In the second tale, an archdeacon employs a summoner who spies around to catch sinners. After witnessing two men committing sodomy, the civil servant runs around town and sees another pair of wrongdoers. Unbeknownst to him, a vendor is stalking him and observing his every move. When the summoner informs the authorities, the merchant observes how the archdeacon urges the sinners to give tributes in exchange for being exempted from punishment. However, one of the men is too poor to pay the requested amount, leading to his persecution. The authorities bring the wrongdoer to the common area to be burned alive in a grill. Among the crowd, the vendor sells fritters to the spectators while watching the poor man's fate. After the event, the summoner heads to the field with his horse to collect rent from a villager. Suddenly, the vendor
vendor greets and befriends him, informing him that they have the same job. When the vendor expresses his desire to be his comrade, the two men shake hands and then agree and swear they'll be brothers until the end of their lives. Shortly after, the men rest under a tree. The vendor then pretends to ask his new friend for tips to earn more money because he's living through extortion and blackmail. Upon hearing this, the summoner mentions that he does the same thing to survive. When the civil servant wants to know his comrade's name, the vendor tells him he's a fiend and lives in a fiery place where sinners go. Following this, they agree to work together and share their profits. Upon arriving at their destination, the rent collector orients his friend that they will visit an old woman who would rather break her neck than hand her contribution. To force her into paying, he informs him that he'll fabricate a lie and tell the senior lady that she has a pending case and will be sent to court if she doesn't pay. The summoner then approaches the old woman and informs her that she must appear in court the next day. He adds that if she wants to be immediately acquitted, she should pay 12 pence. Having no money, the woman begs for mercy, but the rent collector threatens to get her picture if she doesn't pay in cash. In response, the woman wishes that the fiend take the summoner and the pitcher. Suddenly, the vendor asks the woman if she meant her words. The elderly then confirms this and points out that she wants the fiend to take the civil servant alive unless she repents. In response, the summoner claims that he will never do so. Upon hearing this, the fiend fulfills the older person's wish. He then takes the pitcher and informs the summoner that he will take him to a fiery place. In Tabard Inn, the pilgrims have all fallen asleep except for Chaucer, who continues to write more of his fellow travelers' tales. The third tale is about an apprentice, Perkin, who wears a bowler hat and carries a cane. After finishing his apprenticeship, he heads to the town where he casually eats a donut from the child. His act gets the police officer's attention, prompting them to chase him. To evade them, the intelligent man runs toward a narrow alley, leading the man to the Tom's River. Following this, Perkin falls in line with a large bowl to get some soup, prompting the friar to replace his container with a small one. Upon getting his share, the greedy man wants more, causing the annoyed man to chase after him. Like what he did with officers, the apprentice cook runs and leads his pursuer to the water. Following this, Perkin crashes a wedding and gets the bride's attention by dancing. The married woman then joins the apprentice. The cake arrives as he dances with the bride but accidentally bumps it, causing it to land on the groom's face. As a result, the bride's father-in-law throws out the intruder in the ceremony. Upon returning home, Perkin is scolded by his father. The old man then calls his son a disgrace to the family and sends him to bed without feeding him dinner. While the apprentice lies in bed, the mother steals food for him. She then advises him to be a good boy and find a job the next day. The following morning, Perkin asks for a job in the market and gets one as an egg polisher. However, he hits a bowl of eggs with his cane, but they do not break, prompting the store owner to be amazed. Due to his curiosity, the merchant tries to determine if the eggs are unbreakable. But when he flips the bowl, the shells crack. Suddenly, he sees a woman passing by, prompting him to advise the egg polisher to take care of his store as he goes after her. While manning the shop, a group of kids nearby invites Perkin to play a game prompting him to join. Suddenly, the boss returns and catches him in the act, leading to his dismissal. In response, the mischief-making man purposely throws the basket of eggs to the floor, causing the annoyed store owner to get him. However, the unemployed guy manages to hide and mislead the merchant. Following this, Perkins joins his new friend who introduces him to his courtesan wife. Shortly after, he sleeps with them and dreams of dancing with multiple undressed women. Suddenly, the two police officers interrupt his slumber and suddenly arrive arrest him. While in the stocks, he drunkenly sings The Old Piper, a ballad about a senior piper who passes away and is sent to a fiery place where he irritates the fiend with his awful singing. Meanwhile, Chaucer reads a funny tale from a book called The Decameron, getting his wife's attention. Following this, he takes a nap with his cat on his wife. Seeing that he's been slacking, the woman awakens his husband, prompting the man to continue with his next story. In the fourth tale, a poor scholar named Nicholas rents a room next to his carpenter landlord John and his wife Allison, whom he likes. One day while practicing his church song, the student hears that his neighbor will leave with his son for a while. Upon learning this, he immediately heads next door to visit with the woman of his dreams. Nicholas then confesses his undying 
burning love for the carpenter's wife and promises to be her servant if she allows herself to love him. In response, Allison accepts this but on the condition that the student guard their secret. Upon hearing this, the scholar agrees but asks her to bring him a basket worth three days of food, so he'll never leave his room and spill their affair. Following this, the man leaves the woman and continues with his practice. Meanwhile, Martin plays his guitar when his scholar friend and parish clerk Absalom, who is also interested in Allison, invites him to go and see the woman of his dreams. While the couple sleeps, John awakens because of the men singing and informs his wife, who appears uninterested. The following day, John asks his wife about Nicholas who hasn't been going outside. Worried, John peeps through the house and sees the student with his hands raised like a statue. The carpenter barges in to rescue the scholar from a curse and prays for his border's release. Suddenly, the clever man cuts the act and assumes the Lord's messenger's identity, declaring a flood coming in an hour. When John asks if his wife will drown, Nicholas informs him that he should follow his advice to save them all. He then instructs him to prepare three tubs, one for the carpenter, one for the scholar, and Allison, and then hang them up on the ceiling. After following Nicholas's advice, they pray inside the tub until John falls asleep, prompting the scholar and the wife to run away and finally make love. Meanwhile, Martin informs Absalom that the carpenter is missing all day, meaning he can have Allison to himself. When Absalom knocks through the door, Allison informs the scholar that the parish clerk tried to win her with many gifts. She tries to drive him away by telling him she's already in love with another man. However, the other scholar pleads for a kiss if she can't reciprocate his love. He adds that he promises to leave if she fulfills his request. The wife then pranks him by agreeing but showing her behind instead of her face in the window so she can fart on his face. Offended, Absalom quickly runs to a blacksmith's shop where he borrows a hot poker and then returns to Allison's house. To convince Allison to come out, the parish clerk promises to give her a gold ring in exchange for her kiss. Upon hearing this, Nicholas volunteers to deal with the other scholar. He then opens the window and puts out his behind to fart. However, the man strikes him with a hot poker, leading him to cry for water. As the scholar cries, John awakens and thinks the great flood has arrived. The carpenter then cuts the rope holding his tub to the ceiling, leading to his tragic fall to the ground. The fifth tale is about the wife of Bath, a middle-aged woman whose fourth husband gets ill during an intimate time. Following their private moment, the woman gets out of bed and dresses up in red. As she walks through the town, the male villagers are attracted to her presence. Shortly after, she drops by her friend's place and meets the new boarder, Jenkin, who she immediately falls in love with after seeing him bathing. Upon returning home, the middle-aged woman learns that her husband has passed away. Following her husband's demise, the woman's friend sets up the widow with Jenkin at a festival. When they are alone together, she confesses her feelings to the man. Despite their age difference, she disclosed that she dreamt of him and wanted him to marry her. Shortly after, the middle-aged woman and Jenkin get married making him the wife of Bat's fifth husband. While they are in the bedroom, the lady wishes she won't regret passing her lands and rent left by her four late partners to her new spouse. Upon hearing this, the man stands up and reads a book denouncing the sins of Eve and Xanthip, who he believes had led men to misery. Offended, the wife of Bath expresses her hatred for her husband, who tries to point out her faults when she already knows them. She destroys the book, prompting him to push her and hit her head in a barrel. The middle-aged woman feigns injury and tells her new husband she is dying. She accuses him of planning to take her land and inheritance but points out that she has forgiven him. Upon hearing this, the man sobs and leans over to kiss his wife. However, she only bites his nose and laughs. The sixth tale revolves around a manciple in Cambridge who becomes bedridden after an illness. As a result, he cannot perform his duties of watching a miller grind corn. Upon learning this, two students, Alan and John, volunteer to take over the sick officer's task. Upon arriving at the site with their horse, the scholars meet the miller named Simkin. The duo then carries a sack of grain which will be milled into flour. However, the dishonest artisan plans to steal from them and replace the student's flour with bran. To execute his plan, the miller coordinates with his family members. He then releases the horse so the students will go after the animal, allowing them to make the switch. The duo then runs to the field and successfully retrieves their ride. However, since it's late already, they plead for the miller's family 
Lee's hospitality and let them stay the night. Upon hearing their request, Simkin agrees and lets them share a bed beside him and his spouse. However, while they're sleeping, Alan sleeps with the Miller's daughter, Molly. Suddenly, the wife wakes up to go to the restroom but stumbles over a cradle near their bed. To get the Miller's wife, John moves the crib near his area to lead the woman to his bed and sleep with her. The following morning, after making love with Alan, Molly confesses that they have stolen their flour and then directs him to get the loaf they made. After learning this information, the student returns to his bed and mistakes the Miller for John, informing him that he is making love with Molly. Upon hearing this, Simkin immediately attacks the scholar, causing his wife and John to awaken and put the old man down. Afterward, the scholars ride away while eating the loaf from their stolen flour. In the seventh tale, four men spend their time in a brothel. Suddenly, one of them, an intoxicated Rufus, goes out and urinates on the customers for their wrongdoings. The next day, the pissing man's life ends, and a boy informs the three friends that their brother died through a thief's hand implying that his passing was a matter of fate. Upon learning the news, the three friends misinterpret that an actual person harmed their comrade, leading them to avenge his demise and find the perpetrator. In search of the culprit, the trio runs into a roaming old man in a field, whom they blame to be cooperating with their friend's aggressor to end the youth's lives. In response, the friar directs them to the location of Rufus's perpetrator, describing that he left him in the grove under a tree. Following the man's advice, the trio Leo arrives at the site, but instead of finding their comrade slaughterer, they find treasure. To avoid suspicion, the trio proposes a plan to carry the chest by nighttime. Waiting for the sun to come down, the youngest member returns to town to fetch bread and wine for his brothers while the other two guard the treasure. Upon arriving in the town, the man devises a strategy to get the riches all to himself. He purchases rat poison and puts it in the flasks of wine before giving it to his two friends. When the youngest member approaches, the duo thinks of eliminating him to split the treasure between them. As they meet their comrade, the treacherous men drink the flasks of wine and then end their brother's life. However, the two perpetrators succumb to the poison shortly after, resulting in none of them getting the treasure. In the eighth tale, a greedy friar tries to get his dying parishioner Thomas to give him his riches. However, the man explains that he can only only give him one precious thing, prompting the man to promise that he'll share it equally with his fellow friars. Shortly after, the parishioner instructs him to get it from his behind. However, he only farts at his hands and then laughs at him. That night, an angel visits the religious man and invites him to a fiery place where the Prince of Darkness defecates corrupt friars. Following this, the pilgrims reach the Canterbury Cathedral. Meanwhile, Chaucer completes his book and writes that the stories included are told for the enjoyment of storytelling. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.